Good afternoon, my name is Nadine Buys and I'm Professor Animal Genetics at the Department of Biosystems at KU Leuven. And today I will talk about the opportunities and challenges of using CRISPR-Cas9 in animal breeding. So I will not talk about experimental animals that we use to get more insight in gene functioning and gene regulation, but I will talk about animals that we use in food production. Now, one major difference that we already have to take into account is the difference between monogenic traits and polygenic or quantitative traits. Monogenic traits are traits that are caused by one single gene. For instance, if you look at the left side of this, uh, of this slide, you see horned and polled cattle. That is due to one gene and two different alleles, one that stands for horned and the other one for polled. Of course, if you want to do gene editing for getting polled cattle, it is not that difficult to change this one gene. On the other hand, if you look at the right side of the slide, you see at the top a Belgian blue bull and at the bottom a Holstein dairy cow. These animals have been selected, the one for muscularity, the Belgian blue, and the other one for milk production for decades. And milk production and muscularity are not caused by one single gene, but they are caused by numbers of genes, thousands of genes. So at that moment, of course, it's much more difficult to change these phenotypes by gene editing. Now, if we want to do gene editing, First of all, we will start with the monogenic traits, and one of the traits that we are very much interested in then is turning or getting pigs or animals in general that are resistant to certain diseases. An example of those can be PERS, porcine respiratory and uh, reproductive and respiratory virus that we will see, and then there are two different techniques that you can use. The first technique is somatic cell nuclear transfer. What is it? It is that you will change the fibroblast, you will take a fibroblast, a cell, and you will add the gene editing reagents to the fibroblast. Then you will culture the fibroblast, select the ones in which the gene editing is successful, and then you will transfer these fibroblasts to a um, an oocyte, I'm sorry, a oocyte of which the nucleus is removed. You will have a reconstituted zygote and that will be transferred to a recipient animal and the offspring will be a gene edited animal that could be resistant to your disease. A second approach is the zygote injection. In that case, we don't talk about cloning. You will take an oocyte in vitro fertilize it with sperm and then add the genome editing reagents to the zygote and transfer that zygote into a, a recipient mother and the offspring can be a resistant pig. I say can be because you cannot select your zygotes for the ones that are gene edited and the ones that are not. So it's not that sure as the first technology. So talking about this porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome or PERS, it's a major disease in uh, pig production and it is a virus that causes abortions in sows and respiratory problems in growing pigs. The PERS virus uh, enters the body through a receptor and that's called CD163. Now, in some domestic pigs, it was found that they have a non-functional CD163 receptor. And that is due to, um, to another variant in the genome. Now, what was done is that pigs were made, um, were made with gene editing as such that they had a non-functional CD163 receptor and they were challenged with the PRS virus. At the top you see graph A and B, normal pigs that were challenged with the PERS virus, and these normal pigs clearly show symptoms of fever and symptoms of respiratory problems. On the other hand, at the bottom, C and D, 
are the same symptoms or the same characteristics in the knockout pigs. So in the ones that were made non-functional for the CD163 receptor and you clearly see that they don't have respiratory uh, problems and they also don't develop fever. Now this purse might not sound so familiar to you but maybe African swine fever does. African swine fever is a mortal disease in domestic pigs. It causes heavy bleeding and warthogs and wild boars are not susceptible to it. There has been an outbreak of African swine fever in the south of Belgium and that has blocked export of pork products from Belgium to the rest of the world. Now again, warthogs have a different sequence of a receptor that is called RELA receptor in this case and this receptor is less active than the receptor in the domestic pig. There are three mutations if you compare the sequence of the domestic pig with the sequence of the warthog and it seems that the last mutation of the sequence is the one that is causing the difference. Now this last mutation was gene edited in domestic pigs to make the gene for Rela of the domestic pig resemble the one of the warthog. Infectious study Studies have not been performed yet, but I'm sure they are ongoing. So if you want to make resistant animals, it depends on the frequency of the allele, of the favorable allele, so the disease resistant variant of the gene in your population. In the top figure, the frequency of the resistant allele is present in the population where you want, that you want to select for and you can just use selection. Yeah? Of course you have to take care of inbreeding and you might lose production performance. In the second graph your allele frequency or the favorable allele is not present in the line that you want to make resistant but it is present in another indigenous breed. In that case, you can perform crossbreeding and you can select in the crossbred population. But again, your indigenous breed will probably not have such high performance traits as the domestic breed that you are using and you might lose productivity. In the third figure, you see that the resistant allele is not present in your pigs, but it is present in another species. In that case, you cannot crossbreed but you can use gene editing and change the gene of the domestic pig into the gene of the warthog, for instance, as we saw for African swine fever. In the last example, graph D, you see that if you know that a certain genetic variant makes your pigs resistant, but you don't have a population in which this variant is present, the only thing that you can do is gene editing. Gene editing for single genes has been done on quite a lot of genes and in a lot of or quite a few uh, livestock species including bovine, ovine, porcine and caprine. It has been done to achieve disease resistance and two of the examples in this table are the African swine fever and the PERS. It has also been done to increase productivity. For instance, if you look at the bull on the slide that is a Belgian blue bull in which there is a naturally occurring mutation that makes myostatin gene knockout and that causes hypermuscularity. The same knockout or a knockout in the same gene has been made by CRISPR-Cas editing pigs of a Meishan breed and they also show the phenotype of hypermuscularity. Another example in this table shows that they did gene edit three different genes, one of the myostatin and two other ones influencing muscle mass in um, sheep and they found that uh, they got hypermuscled sheep and knockout of the three genes in 6% of the offspring. So that is one of the challenges they only have 6% of the injected zygotes that were successful. And we see that the success rate changes or varies from half a percent up to 
Another challenge is that in these studies, we saw that in two different studies, there were off-target mutations. So not only the gene that you intend to change was changed, but there were also other genes that were changed. That ends the monogenic traits. If we now go to the polygenic traits, so for instance, the muscularity in pigs, in sheep, in cattle, or the milk production in cows, then it's another story. Instead of having to change one single gene, you will have to change several genes. On the left figure, in A, we see that we have a gene-edited bore for one or more genes, and it's a simulation study. So a gene-edited bore will be mated with a normal pig, normal sow, and the offspring will be heterozygous. From then on, it's one out of two chance whether the edited gene will be passed to the next generation or the wild type gene. So it goes very slowly and you see that in graph A, it, you really only have a few pink pigs with the edited gene. Another approach is gene drive. In gene drive, a sequence of CRISPR is introduced together with your changed gene. And that will lead to the fact that the sister chromatid will always also be cut and will be made gene edited as well. So the same editing will be performed on the sister chromatid. That means that the offspring of your first generation is immediately homozygous. And you see that in graph B, the spreading of the edited gene throughout the population goes a lot faster. On the right-hand side of the slide, you see a graph in which they simulate a population of 1,000 animals, pigs, in which 25 boars are selected each generation. If you would select for favorable alleles, and you would select for, favorable allele, for a favorable allele that is present in half of the cases, so 50%, after 20 generations you would achieve 20, uh, 72 to 75%, the blue line. If you would perform gene editing, the normal gene editing, you could achieve 100% of the favorable allele after six generations only, and if you would use gene drive, so making the animals immediately homozygous, it would be achieved in only two generations. So it goes a lot faster. This gene drive is a method to spread your edited gene throughout the population in a lot faster way. Another way is spermatogonial stem cells. What is it? In that case, you will change the spermatogonial stem cells of a high-valued boar, and you will transfer them to a surrogate boar. What is a surrogate boar? Well, surrogate boars have been made in a way that they don't express the NANOS2 gene. The NANOS2 gene is a gene that is very important in developing fertility in male animals and in being able to produce sperm cells. So CRISPR-Cas edited boars have been knocked out for this NANOS2 genes and they don't produce any sperm cells anymore. Then you take a wild-type boar. It can be a wild-type boar, a normal boar that is of very high value, but it can also be a boar in which you did do gene editing for a certain trait. The spermatogonial stem cells of the wild-type boar will be transferred into the testis of the NANOS2 knockout boar that doesn't produce any sperm cells anymore, and it will be introduced in the rete testis. If then the boar was checked, it was proven that the wild-type boar sperm was produced by the surrogate boar while the genome of the surrogate boar itself showed clearly two different alleles for the NANOS2 gene in which both of them there was a deletion, so non-functional genes. In the sperm there was a functional NANOS2 gene that clearly was derived from the wild type boar. Now so far studies that have been done all over the world. Are we doing CRISPR-Cas in our own lab? Well, we are not for the moment. 
It might be that we would use CRISPR-Cas, for instance, in a certain research project in which we try to identify the genetic variant that is causing mange susceptibility in Belgian blue cattle. If we, we are pretty close to it, and if we would identify the possible or the probable causative mutation, it might be an idea to make CRISPR-Cas animals to knock out that mutation or to apply that mutation on an experimental basis. So for scientific research to investigate gene functioning. Using CRISPR-Cas to produce animals for uh, farming, for food production, well, in the EU, cloned animals, GMO animals and gene-edited animals cannot come uh, into the food chain. So they are not allowed into the food chain. So that really puts a hold on using CRISPR-Cas in research for food producing animals in Europe. Now, is it accepted? Because there is a difference between using CRISPR-Cas in plants and in animals. In animals, animal welfare is a big issue. This, is, this slide is from a study that was performed in Japan and on the bottom left you see a graph that shows would people accept cloned animals? It was not about gene-edited animals, it was about cloned animals. And it was clear that only 8% of the people that responded to the questionnaire would accept cloned animals. All the other ones would not. And why not? Because they don't trust the researchers, but, or they don't have enough trust in the researchers, or they don't have enough trust in the regulatory uh, affairs, or they don't know enough about it, or they care about animal welfare. If you ask scientists what they would use gene editing for in farm animals, they say to improve human health. You could produce in the milk of dairy animals, you could produce substances that are beneficial for human medicine. You could also CRISPR-Cas pigs that has been done that cause less rejection of organs if you think about xenotransplantation. You could also use gene editing to improve the animal health. We saw examples like PERS and African swine fever. You can use CRISPR-Cas to improve animal production. Think about the myostatin and the hypermuscularity. And you can use it to improve animal welfare. So not only animal health, but also welfare more general. And some people say that dehorning in a non-surgical way is a way to improve animal welfare. On the other hand, the public looks at it in a completely different way. The public sees that there are quite a lot of embryos that don't survive, that don't make it towards a newborn. There are quite some abnormalities in this gene editing technology and we should be able to control it. They also expect from scientists that they have, um, that they don't only look at is it feasible in agriculture and is it safe for food, but also what are the consequences of off-target um, mutations and what are the systemic influences of on-target mutations. So the public looks at it from a different point of view than the researchers and a dialogue between both is really necessary in this and animal welfare is a major topic in this dialogue. So that brings me to the end of my talk. I, so, I hope that I gave you some insights of what the challenges and the opportunities of gene editing in farm animals are, and I thank you for your attention.